Welcome back to our lesson in our first chapter of organic chemistry. In our next topic, we're going to take a look at something called an isomer. An isomer is defined as a different compound that have the same molecular formula. We focus really on something called a constitutional isomer. A constitutional isomer are those that have the same molecular formula, but different connectivity to their atoms. They're just connected in a different order, although they're reduced to the same molecular formula. We'll also look at something called a structural formula. Structural, in terms of perhaps you've heard of cis and trans, we'll take a look at that as well in our journey. Now let me bring a little bit of um, you know, visual to this word definition of constitutional isomer. We have a compound with a molecular formula of C4H10. And we're learning in organic chemistry that molecules are all carbon chains. We would never place a hydrogen in as a central atom. So when I read C4, that shows me that those four carbons are connected to make a carbon backbone in this molecule. We've also been practicing that carbon requires four bonds to fill its octet. So I can go ahead and fill each one of those carbons with the bond that I know it requires, and you'll notice that it will take all 10 hydrogens to complete the octet of each of the carbons. And so we'll notice we've had one, two, three, four carbons, and we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens. We've proposed one constitutional isomer for a compound that contains four single bonds to each carbon and ten hydrogens to complete the octet. What might another arrangement look like that would be different in connectivity but the same overall molecular formula? And as we draw a second uh, example, what if we were to create a branched chain? So instead of having all four carbons in a row, what if we created a branched chain and placed a carbon off the central carbon atom in the longest carbon chain? You'll also notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've placed 10 hydrogens to complete the octet of each of those carbons. And I think I have them all. And again, you'll see that it has the same molecular formula. One was referred to as a straight chain. And we'll soon learn that this is called an alkane. When we look at our functional groups in Chapter 2, the straight chain are called alkanes. One, two, three, four, this will be called butane. The prefix but represents four carbons in a straight chain. All single bonds is the A-N-E ending. Now over down, you know, just to take a look here, the longest carbon chain is only three carbons long, and when we name and we're, again, just seeding ahead future lessons. This is not the learning goal of this, uh, you know, of this particular section, but I like to throw ahead things that we'll, we'll find along the way. The longest carbon chain is three, and so we'll learn that that will have a prefix of prop to represent three, propane. We also see that off of carbon two is a methyl group, and that functional group, again, coming in chapter two, Methyl, that prefix, represents one carbon. Off of carbon two, there's a methyl group. So we would name that compound 2-methylpropane. Butane, 2-methylpropane, all have the same number of each type of atom. They've just connected them in a different way, making two very distinct examples. Here's what we just drew. We drew butane, four carbons in a row, and we drew methylpropane. Now, what's interesting in that? You see how I drew that in an ordinary Lewis dot structure? We're going to be practicing how to turn those into line structures. See these, these structural formulas? Carbon one, two, three, four, all with their correct molecular geometry, 
geometry bound angles. And here was the propane backbone, one, two, three, and off of that second carbon was the methyl group. Here's another example of what we call constitutional isomers, one chloropropane on carbon number one. In a three carbon chain, we see a chlorine hanging off of it, one chloropropane. A constitutional isomer, instead of having the chlorine off of the first carbon, we could place it on the second, and we come up with two chloropropane. Two very different chemicals, two very different molecules, different physical properties, different chemical properties, just by placing the chlorine in a different position. The term we're practicing are constitutional isomers. Since we're not in class, <laughs> we're not taking an attendance sheet. If you are in class listening to this at a different level, this is what we would work together. But this was because we didn't have class. It's a makeup video. We can draw constitutional isomers with C2H6O. Can you pause the video and just try that on your own? What are some different ways we can arrange two carbons, six H's, and an oxygen? Try it out, and when ready, start back up. You must be ready to think about checking some work. One of these opportunities was to make an alcohol. You put your two carbons in a row, carbon one, carbon two, off of one side, you put the alcohol group, and again, we might or might not know that this is a functional group in organic chemistry. The OH is a functional group representing an alcohol coming in Chapter 2. And you can see that the other hydrogens filled the octet for the carbons that needed some. C2H6O is the molecular formula when drawn has an OH group hanging off of one of the carbons. The other opportunity, perhaps you kind of figured this out, was an, a functional group known as an ether, placing the oxygen in the center and having a methyl group on each side. This represents two constitutional isomers. They have the exact same molecular formula, but their atoms are bonded in a different way. Butanoic acid, we'll learn that this COOH group in our next chapter is called a carboxylic acid functional group. We'll soon learn that COO with an, instead of an H, if it has an alkyl group here, we'll learn about its functional group as well. And I don't want to overwhelm you with chapter two topics, but we can start to see different arrangements for the same atoms, just connected in a different way. The learning goal here, here is to practice the term a constitutional isomer. On your homework, we can try one to give you some practice. It asks us to draw for all the structural isomers with the formula C3H7Br. So notice this halogen is going to be attached to one of the carbons. Now remember in chemistry, it's all about carbon backbones. I can place the bromine on carbon number one, fill the octet with all of the other hydrogens, so these will be the H's, And that way I filled out all the carbon octet and I've used seven H's to do so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I placed the bromine on carbon number one. One bromo propane. Practicing a skill that's not yet introduced, but I like to kind of see things that are coming. And instead of having carbon on number one with the bromine, what if we switched it around and just put it on number two and made two bromo propane? And again, remember to complete the octet with the other hydrogens. Just by shifting the location of the bromine, we've created two structural isomers, constitutional isomers that have the same molecular formula. Let me just comment, if you were to make the bromine on this carbon, 
and think that that would be a different structure than the one we drew here, it's not. It's just that molecule flipped over. That would still be carbon number one, two, three, and it would still be one bromopropane. So there are only two distinct positions to place the bromine on a propane three carbons long. Let's take a look here at what we call structural formulas. We've been kind of peeking at them in the last, um, you know, the last section there and that I was drawing. What are all these different ways to represent the same type of compound? We can see from our um, molecular geometry kits, you might have a ball and stick model you can actually build. We have the classic Lewis dot or electron dot structure formulas that I was drawing on the previous slides as well. That's what letter B is showing us. We can have the dash formula. So instead of having all of these dots, we replace those dots with what we have lines to represent uh, single covalent bonds. We have something called a condensed formula, which really takes a little bit of practice to kind of get the hang of that. Notice here carbon number one with three hydrogens on it. So you see carbon one, and right after that carbon, it shows you what's attached to it. Carbon number two, that's this carbon, and right after it, it shows you what's attached to it, two more H's. Let's call this position three, and what's attached to it? Well, we have two H's and an OH group, all written after carbon three, although I'll tell you, I just did that wrong. The priority carbon would have the functional group. When we name that, we'll call that carbon one, but we get the idea. I'm telling you that when we write out a formula, carbon's written first, and any element that's attached to it written next, then you'll start the next carbon, and so forth. And in the last one, called a bond line formula, which is really the organic, organic chemist's lazy way to write a formula, and boy, does it truly save time and give great visual. What it does is allow for us to place the carbons at the bend of each line, representing the other elements, such as the functional group here, the alcohol functional group, using its symbols. And notice what we've eliminated the connected hydrogens to each carbon because we know they're there. The hydrogens always complete the octet. If it were a different element other than hydrogen, we must draw it. But if it's simple hydrogens completing the octet of the carbon, we know they're there. Let's just eliminate it to make it look like a cleaner formula. So section seven, the learning goal there is to practice truly with the um, dash formulas, turning them into condensed formulas, and turning them into bond line formulas, ultimate goal right here. I don't really draw the dots anymore. And when I'm building, the building helps me like with rotation of bonds and trying to see molecular geometry. And I still to this day need to build some time to figure out where is the molecules, um, you know, major, major structure and how can a reactant fit in there. So here's some structural formulas, all these different varieties shown on the previous page. The dash formula, where the single bonds are used to represent, uh, you know, the, the lines here representing single bonds. A condensed formula, where the carbon is written and everything attached to it directly after it. The bond line formula, where these bends in the structure re represent the carbons. The hydrogens attached have been removed to make it a cleaner structure. Later on in our journey, we'll talk about Fisher projections. Here are the carbons, carbon one, two, three, and we'll learn about into and out of the page. It's really kind of a very similar structure to what we'll practice later in a Newman projection. Here's the central carbon, what's in front of it and what's behind it as you look straight on at the molecule. These ones I often have to build in my hand to hold the model so I can see it. We will use dash line wedge formulas to help us see what's coming out of the page, what's going into the page, and what's in the same plane as the page. If you see a solid line, that's in the exact same plane as the carbon backbone. If you see a dashed wedge, that's showing you that that hydrogen is behind the page. And if you see a solid wedge, 
you know that that's coming out of the page directly at you. It's giving us a three-dimensional look. So if you were to take your model kit and build this molecule, and you look straight on, straight at this carbon, hold it up to your eye and look at it, you wouldn't see this hydrogen behind you. It's hidden. So we're showing that with a dashed wedge. This hydrogen would probably hit you in the forehead. It's coming out of the page. We're showing that with a solid wedge. So we get some three-dimensional feels with the Newman projections, the dashed line wedge formula, as well as a Fisher projection all give us a three-dimensional look. Now, I'll tell you, the Fisher and the Newman are not part of this particular section, but I wanted to see that they are coming. Let's look at the dash structural formula of propyl alcohol. And just to remind you, if you have your kit, it really would be worth kind of building these and kind of proving to yourself what these visuals are showing you. I wanted us to notice that carbon 1, 2, 3, Carbon-1 contains this functional group called an alcohol, the OH. If I simply spin, take, the, take your model and twist the carbon backbone, you can form a conformational, um, you know, just a different structure, a conformational equivalent structure to the first overall structure just by twisting the carbon-carbon bond. Remember that sigma bonds, have free rotation. So you can twist them in space all day long. They have a freedom to move around. Now, I can't say that they're all equal in energy because molecules don't like to be crowded. They want to make sure that their bonds, their atoms have you know, as much room around them as they possibly can. But sigma bonds, single bonds, remember that the single bonds have more rotation to them. So any moment in time, those molecules might have spun the direction of those single bonds. The condensed structural formula, they're somewhat faster to write than the dash formulas. So instead of saying, you know, CH3, CH2, COH, and it's kind of that same structure as before, that takes some time to show the connectivity and so forth. So with the condensed structure, we write the first carbon's position and what's attached to it. We go to the next carbon and show what's attached to it. We go to that third carbon and show what's attached to it. And instead of having to draw the structural line, we begin to see the attachment just based on the way you're organizing your formula. So all of the atoms that are attached to the carbon are usually written immediately after that carbon, and we list the hydrogen first. And then if there is a, a functional group, it would be written after that initial hydrogen. We can say these names in terms of carbon counting, chemistry style. If there's one carbon, we call it methane. Two carbons, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. Counting carbon styles. And these are all single bonds. Notice the A-N-E ending to represent the family of all single bonds, ane. In the condensed structural formulas, we are moving from connecting all of the atoms, as we did in a dash formula, to showing their arrangement through connectivity. Put the carbon first, and whatever is attached to the carbon immediately after, hydrogen's getting priority. So notice carbon number two has a chlorine added. The carbon number two has the chlorine bond, and so you'll show carbon two has a hydrogen first, and then the functional group of the halogen. In this structure, carbon two has a functional group, this alcohol, the OH. So carbon-2 must show the functional group written after it. So here's CH3, CH, remember the hydrogen gets priority, then there's the OH still attached to carbon-2, followed by the third CH3. The bond line formulas. Let's talk a little bit about what structures that look like this. 
each line represents a bond. At the terminus of each line represents a carbon atom. So when I think about those two rules, this is a bond between two carbon atoms. This is a bond between two carbon atoms. So each line represents the bond. Each bend in a line or terminus of a line, and that just means the end, those are terminus points, represents carbon atoms unless another group is shown explicitly. I might need to draw in an OH or an alcohol, for instance. I can't just leave out the O and the H. They must be present. No letter Cs are written for carbon atoms, except optionally for a methyl group, the CH3, at the end of a chain or branch. You may choose to show that to show it's the end of the chain. No letter Hs are shown for hydrogen, unless they're needed in a three-dimensional perspective, in which case we could use that dashed line if it's behind the page, or we can use a solid wedge if it's coming out of the page. The number of hydrogen atoms bonded to each carbon is inferred. We know with confidence how many hydrogen atoms there are because we just know to fill the octet of every carbon with a hydrogen. When an atom other than carbon or hydrogen is present, the symbol for that element is written in the proper location. Like, I would have to show where the hydroxyl group is if I were trying to draw an alcohol. I have to show you the O and the H. And I just did something that is either correct. I can show O bonded to H, or I could just write OH, and you already know that the bond between the atoms is there. When an atom other than carbon or hydrogen is present, we have to write that out and show its proper location. And remember, hydrogen atoms bonded to atoms other than carbon, especially oxygen, nitrogen, we must write those out explicitly. It would be incorrect to show a hydroxyl group, the OH, as just O. We have to show the hydrogen because it's not connected to a carbon that's there to just fill an octet. It's more important than that. It's part of a functional group. And these are kind of fun to draw, and it just takes a little practice. We'll try one here together. I'm going to count one, two, three, four carbons in this overall carbon backbone. One, two, three, four carbons. If you build, remember this is SP3 hybridized. We call this tetrahedral. It has bond angles of about 109 degrees, depending if there's a lone pair of electron, but approximately 109 degrees for tetrahedron. So when I'm drawing the bond angles, that's why I'm drawing them bended and not in a straight row. If you put four carbons together in a molecular model, they don't line up in the same plane. They bend up and down, up and down. Now notice what I've done. I've made carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. I put one, two, three, four carbons in a row. Now what else do we have? Carbon number one has three hydrogens on it. So I don't need to draw anything there. They're all filling the octet of that carbon. No need to draw them. Carbon number two has a chlorine coming off of it. If we call this carbon number two, I have to show that explicitly by placing a chlorine on carbon two, bonded. I do not have to show this hydrogen because I know it's just there to fill the octet of the carbon. Carbon number three, nothing to show, just two H's. And carbon number four, nothing to show. We know that they're there because they're there to fill the octet of the carbon. We've just drawn two chlorobutane. Now let's see what we have. Let's practice carbon one, carbon two, attached to carbon two is another methyl group. It's why it's in a parenthesis, showing it as an attachment to the previous carbon. Carbon three, carbon four. There are four carbons in the backbone of this molecule. Carbon one, carbon two, 
carbon three, carbon four. There's the backbone of four carbons. Carbon number one simply has three hydrogens on it, nothing to draw. Carbon number two has a methyl group coming off of it. We must show that functional group. And I'm going to show as carbon number two a methyl group attached to that carbon. Now, I don't have to put the carbon because I know it's at the terminus point of a bond. I know that it's a carbon because I'm not stating a different atom. And therefore, I do not need those three hydrogens because I know they're there filling the octet of the carbon. Carbon three has two hydrogens, no need to draw. And those the carbon four finishes with three hydrogens for its octet. Here we've drawn two methyl butane. On carbon two, is a funct it's, it's, it's a, a functional group of an alkyl group. We'll learn that in Chapter 2, an alkyl group. To methyl, that prefix methyl shows this CH3 unit hanging off of the backbone at carbon 2. Here we have some from our textbook. I just took a screenshot and showed the ones that we really just drew together. Carbon number 2 has a chlorine. We don't draw that. All those little hydrogens here are just assumed to be there. At carbon 2 is the functional group chlorine. Here we have the, the one we just drew as well. On carbon 2, there's a methyl group. And I just wanted to point out in your text, they accidentally wrote chlorine there, but they meant to write a methyl group and so forth. Notice in the carbon backbone here, we have a nitrogen. So we must explicitly write the nitrogen in the backbone of our molecule. We have to show if it's any other element other than carbon, it has to be written. And so we end up with a structural formula that looks like this. Here's a methyl group, CH3. Here's a methyl group, CH3. And here's an ethyl group, that's two carbon prefix, ethyl, carbon one, carbon two of the ethyl group. We can take some time, and I just want you to pause and just start thinking about how you would represent, in just a simple format, the carbons and the way that they're bonded together. Here we have cyclopropane. Cyclopropane is three carbons connected in a cyclic structure. There it is. Cyclobutane, four carbons attached in a cyclic structure. Looks like a square. Notice here with a double bond, what we do in our formula, we show the double bond between the carbons. So recall, I'm going to make that a thin line so I can not overwrite the structure too bad. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Between carbon 2 and 3 is a double bond. And so notice what we've done. We've made a double bond, and it's changed the bond angle there because now all of a sudden this carbon is one, two, three domains, so it's sp2 hybridized. That's trigonal planar. So you have to make that bond angle more of 120 degrees like a triangle. So that just takes some practice. Notice that it's it's got a little different molecular geometry because of the double bond here. This carbon, by the way, is also sp2 hybridized. So we show that it's just a little bit different bond angle than we would have before. Like a straight chain, you're looking at um, you know, tetrahedral sp3 hybridized. So that bond angle is 109 degrees. And then, OK, here's another look. Here's carbon 1, 2, 3. Carbon 1, 2, double bond there shown just by looking at a single double bond. Now here, this is a triple bond. Whoops, triple bond. I can't write. There we go. So when I look at this carbon, I'll count from here. Carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, four, five. Do you see that there are five carbons in this model? 
one, two, three, four, five. I wanted to show you where those are located on that structure. Now, carbon two and carbon three are S P hybridized, two electron domains. That makes their molecular geometry linear, 180 degrees. So notice that this becomes a very flat, straight line to show the molecular geometry. If I have a triple bond on one side and a single bond on the other, it's going to come straight out at 180 degrees. Same on this side. So we end up with a very long line. You know, it's like drawing a long line and then carbon number five at the end. Because now all of a sudden this guy is back to being sp3 hybridized. Carbon one, carbon two, triple bond, carbon three, four, five. You have some homework practice trying to draw some of these. Some are quite simple. Propane is an alkane with a molecular formula of three carbons, C3H8. Draw the complete structure of propane. Draw all the hydrogen atoms. So what they're asking you to do is draw the structure as you would in a Lewis dot structure. And you're showing all the presence of each atom in terms of how they're connected. So that one is kind of just straightforward Lewis dot. B, draw the structure of propane in skeleton mode or as a bond line structure. Eliminate those hydrogens. Three carbons. Carbon one, remember these are all sp3 hybridized, means that there's four electron domains, means they're tetrahedral, which means that their bond angle is about 109 degrees. So carbon one, two, three. That's what it looks like. You build it and prove it to yourself. Those carbons are not in a row. They're not linear. They're going to bend up and down, up and down, and end up looking like this. Get the hydrogens off, and we've drawn the structural bond line formula from the Lewis dot formula. That's pretty easy. These dashed wedges represent those atoms that are behind the plane. Solid wedges represent bonds that are coming out of the page. And if it's an ordinary line, they represent the same plane as the paper. This challenges you to start thinking three-dimensional. So when I look at this particular molecule, I have two carbons. Two carbons has a prefix called ethane. Carbon number two, it doesn't matter, I'll just tuck this one. This hydrogen is in the same plane. If I lay this molecule flat, it would lie on the same tabletop as this carbon. This hydrogen is going to lie behind the carbon, going into the table, and this hydrogen is coming out of the table. Remember that it's tetrahedron. So in other words, if you have like a carbon in the central atom, two of the H's, two of the bonds will be in the same plane. One of them must come out and one of them must go behind. Two will be in the same plane, always, in an SP3 configuration. And I keep trying to draw a dash line there. That's kind of a general rule. Two bonds are always in the same plane. Here's those two bonds. One is behind, one comes out. Here's that carbon in this position. Two bonds are always in the same plane. One will be a wedge, one will be a dash. SP3 hybridized. So that carbon with four single bonds with that 109 degree tetrahedral molecular geometry, one bond behind the plane using a dashed wedge, one bond in front of the plane using a solid wedge, one bond will be flat and the other will connect to the rest of the molecule. So just thinking about that, there's three bonds to carbon. They're all in the same plane. Always make the backbone of the molecule the same plane. One of the hydrogens will be in the same plane on the terminal end. That leaves 
One will be a wedge coming out. One has to be a dash going behind. Now remember, in the middle carbon, here's its two bonds already in the same page, in the same plane. Only two bonds in the same plane, and they might be going to the other atoms it's connected to. So meaning that one of these has to be a dash, the other has to be a wedge. Two bonds in the same plane, one has to be a wedge, one has to be a dash. Double bonds have trigonal planar geometry. You're looking at sp2 hybridization. The 120 de degree bond angle makes it a very um, flat molecule. It's planar. So remember that when you're drawing in, in terms of double bonds, the bond angle has changed just a little bit. And then a triple bond, we talked about having linear sp hybridization makes it linear. This is trigonal planar. We drew some of those earlier, and we'll just keep practicing. So here we see that I have a triple bond. Notice that it's a very linear part of the molecule. Anytime you have just sp hybridization, you'll have 180 degrees coming out as the bond angle, flat straight line. Here you have a molecule with sp2, which is trigonal planar molecular geometry. Notice now that the bond angles are more of 120 degrees, equilateral triangle. And here we have sp3 hybridization, which of course we know is tetrahedral. That is about 109 degrees, and that's what we practice by saying two in the same plane. One will be a dash, one will be a wedge. So just to bring conclusion to this part, remember to draw as many carbon atoms in the plane of the paper as possible. Make the backbone in the same plane and then use the dash or solid wedges for substituent groups such as hydrogens or the functional group that you need to show the three dimensions. Ready? Keep the carbon in the same backbone. We've practiced a little bit already writing some of these dimensions. I can do a few more. And here's just a structural formula where we have, the first one is methyl chloride. I have one carbon. I know that one carbon needs two attachments in the same plane. And if you build this, you're going to rotate the molecule, so it doesn't matter which way you, you draw those. It's freedom to, to rotate in space. But as long as two are drawn on the same plane, one of them will be drawn as a dash, saying it's behind the carbon. And one of them needs to be drawn as a wedge coming out of the page. It's not a very clean wedge. Let's see. And these are just really the same thing, except you're taking off a hydrogen and putting on a halogen. If I have two carbons in a row, place the two carbons in the same plane. Each carbon can have up to two bonds in the same plane. So let's just make those hydrogens, if you will. This carbon written here has a dash and a wedge. I said that backwards. A wedge and a dash to fill its octet. And this carbon will have a chlorine and a hydrogen to fill its octet. Very simplistic once you get practicing. I'm going to pause the video here and we'll come back together and talk about resonance and the Vesper chart.